Yeah, we'll start the last session. I think before the crowd decreases further, I do. Let's invite our chairperson, Dr. Bhavin, to sit on the chair there and guide us. And we we'll start with the talk. And the panelists in the front row, Dr. Bhavki, the madam. They can join. Or they can join there on the dais also. So Dr. Preeti Meshram is a professor and head of uh, department in JJ group of hospitals. Yeah, please, madam. Thank you for coming. Aj, yeah. Aap, 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 please. We have enough chairs, I think. Yeah. Dr. Abhijit. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Bhavuk, thank you for coming from Delhi. Meer, sir. Ah, Meer. Ringai, sir, please come, sir. Dr. Ringai is a professor uh, in GMC, Aurangabad. So we'll start. I think we are right on time. So let me invite Dr. Preeti to Mishram. Mishram to give the first talk on how to write the right antituberculous treatment to orthopedic surgeons. Thank you so much. It's better to avoid it. <laughs> So good evening all, and to begin with, I would like to thank Viroc and its organizers, especially Dr. Dheeraj Sunavne, Dr. Fadnes for giving me this opportunity to talk. Um, so I am from the Department of Pulmonary Medicine and deal with a lot of tuberculosis, a lot of referrals from the orthopedic department to us. Uh, I'll begin, my talk would be basically about a few cases which we commonly see with errors, and I'll also be giving brief updates about the National Tuberculosis Elimination Program. Uh, let, to err is human, and when we as doctors err, it turns out to be pretty bad for our patients and very unforgivable for the doctors. So medication errors, especially while uh, prescribing for tuberculosis, are multifactorial. Partly because when we are dealing with tuberculosis, we're just not dealing with one organism, but a whole subpopulation of organisms. So we ha these are the four common types that I have you know, enumerated the actively growing ones which are taken care by isoniazide, the slow non-replicating ones taken care by rifampicin, the intracellular ones killed by parasinamide, and there are the persisters which are not killed by anyone, by any anti-TB medication at all. Okay, so given this background, we have to prescribe at least three drugs to take care of tuberculosis. So in, when we write prescriptions, there can be errors in the regimens, in the dosages of the drugs that we write, and in the diagnosis. So diagnosis, we all would say, oh, it's tuberculosis. But now, with so much of drug-resistant tuberculosis, we do have to give the patients a diagnosis of whether it's drug-sensitive or drug-resistant, okay? So we cannot simply start the patients on empirical AKT. So I would be discussing a few cases, as I've told you earlier. So the first case is of a 45-year-old male who's been diagnosed with pot spine. He weighs 68 kilograms. So he's been given this drug, AKT4, which contains three, 300 milligrams of isoniazide, 800 milligrams of ethambutol, two tablets of 750 milligrams of pyrazinamide, and one tablet of 450 milligrams of rifampicin. Seems fine, he's been asked to take one strip per day. What is wrong? So he weighs 68 kilograms. The dosage is much, much higher for his weight, okay? The prescription dosage is lesser, okay? So he needs a higher dose, but he's been prescribed a suboptimal dose. And the second most important thing is that he has not been given a microbiological confirmation of his diagnosis. He hasn't been told whether it is drug-sensitive TB or drug-resistant TB. The second case is of a 50-year-old male, again, pot spine, rifampicin-sensitive, weighs 45 kg. So as per his weight, he has been started on a combination of HREZ according to his weight, but he's also been given canamycin. So it seems okay, we have a lot of prescriptions where injectables are added. But is it correct? According to the NTEP guidelines now, injectable drugs are not a part of regimen for drug sensitive TB. Okay, they have to be used only for the management of drug resistant TB. The third case is of a 24 year old female who is having rifampicin sensitive pot spine. She weighs 45 kilograms. She has started on three tablets of fixed dose combination of four drugs. Looks okay. She develops joint pains within the first 15 days of starting AKT. She goes back to her doctor. Her doctor stops the pyrazinamide. We all know pyrazinamide is the commonest cause for joint pains. 
So the doctor stops the pyrazinamide and adds levofloxacin. So this is commonly what we see, but is it correct? No. So what should have been done? The joint pain should have been evaluated. Uric acid levels should have been sent for. Other causes of joint pain should have been looked into before actually stopping the pyrazinamide. So you first treat the joint pains, try and restart the pyrazinamide. And the second most important thing is you never add a single dose to any regimen and levofloxacin or any quinolone for that matter is a drug reserved for drug resistant TB. So this, as I've said in the beginning only, this is a rapamycin sensitive TB. The fourth case is of a 19 year old male, psoas sepsis, which is rapamycin sensitive. The patient weighs 46 kilograms, is started on fixed dose combination of three tablets, follows up after two months doing extremely well, put on weight, from 46 kilograms, he's moved, he's become 52 kilograms. The doctor feels he's fine, so he shifts him from the intensive phase of four drugs to three fixed dose combination drugs, okay? So three tablets have been started. Looks fine. What is wrong? So he has gained weight in the interim period from 46 kgs, he's become 52 kgs. So he's moved on to a higher weight band. So whenever a patient gains weight during his course of treatment, it is very imperative that we increase the dosages of the anti-TB treatment as well, okay? So we have to take care of all these little, little things even by during the follow-up. So if the patient gains weight, we have to increase the dosages of AKTOs. The fifth case is of a 34-year uh, female diagnosed with pod spine, weighs 45 kilograms. She received, she has been given three tablets of four FDCs. She comes after two months saying that she is still symptomatic. So the doctor adds levofloxacin into her regimen, okay? And asks her to follow up after one month. She follows up after one month, there's worsening back pain, the MRI shows worsening lesions, a biopsy is done, which shows rifampicin resistant TB. So what is wrong? Wrong a whole lot of things. The first and the foremost is that she's not been given a microbiological confirmation of a disease upfront, which should have been done at the very beginning itself, okay? So, you know, she wouldn't have wasted three months and the second most important thing, as I've told you previously, never add a single drug to a failing regimen, okay? So single drug was added, that is levofloxacin, and she was not given any microbiological confirmation of the disease. Uh, the sixth case is again of a 19-year-old fe uh, female with uh, rifampicin-resistant pot spine. She weighs 45 kilograms, and she was started on a regimen, which is according to the NTEP guidelines containing bedequinine, linozolate, levofloxacin, clofazamine, and cyclosporin. What is wrong? Seems okay? No. So cyclosporin and cycloserin. We get a lot of these prescriptions where instead of cyclosporin, cyclosporin is written. We have to keep in mind that cyclosporin is an immunosuppressant. It actually decreases the CD4 cell count, which is used for fighting tuberculosis. So we have cycloserin and cyclosporin being interchanged. So we have to be very careful, especially when we are writing prescriptions for similar sounding drugs. A brief about, so these are the common prescription errors that we have come across. So I'll just give you a brief about the NTEP guidelines, that is the Nas National Tuberculosis Elimination Program guideline. We no longer are trying to control tuberculosis, we are trying to eliminate tuberculosis, hence the name. So now there is an integrated algorithm for drug sensitive and drug resistant TB, and it is purely, purely based upon culture reports or microbiological confirmation. So we, for the drug resistant TB, we have tailor-made regimens, based on the gene expert, the LPA, and the liquid culture DST reports. And even for the drug sensitive ones, we have it based whether the patient is rifampicin sensitive as well as INS sensitive, okay? So it's an integrated algorithm. We follow this whenever we are treating patients with tuberculosis. So the new things in NTEP is that now, FDZ is the first line, or the HREZ is available as fixed dose combinations, available in blister packs, according to weight bands. We no longer categorize uh, TB into CAT1 and CAT2, but we ca categorize it into drug sensitive and drug resistant, irrespective of whether it is new or previously treated. Injectables are not preferred, and we have preference for oral regimens. So, as I've told you on the previous slide, injectables are a strict no no even for drug resistant tuberculosis, and pediatric dosages are also available in blister packs. So, this is a regimen for drug sensitive TB. The intensive phase is of four drugs for two months, and the continuation phase is, for three, of, is of three drugs for four months. The continuation phase can be extended by further six months in certain cases like, the C, like CNS-TB, skeletal TB, 
or disseminated TB. So even though the regimen is of six months, we can further extend it by another six months in cases of, especially in cases of skeletal TB. Uh, so this is how the drug dosages for first-line anti-TB drugs look like. So this is according to the weight, and there are weight bands. So most of our patients tend to fall in the 35 to 49 kilogram weight band and end up taking three tablets, both in the intensive as well as the continuation phase. These are dosages as per the milligram per kilogram. And the maximum doses is for uh, isoniazide is 300, for rifampicin is 600, ethambutol is 1500, and for pyrazinamide is 2 grams. These are the drugs used for MDR-TB treatment. We've categorized the drugs into group A, B, and C. Group A and group B drugs are the ones that are commonly used to make a regimen. Group C contain the injectables and are used as a backup. So to summarize, it's important that we do not start patients in empirical AKT. We always uh, categorize them to drug sensitive and drug resistant and then start treatment. Dosages have to be as per the weight band. We do not add a single drug to a failing regimen or do not change the drugs frequently as per the ADR. Quinolones and aminoglycosides are only for drug resistant TB. If there is rifampicin resistance, it is advisable to refer to a specialist who deals in patients treating with uh, patients having drug resistant TB. And we have to be careful while we are writing drugs which are very similar sounding. Thank you for your patience, li patient listening. These are the two websites where you can actually register your clinics or your institutes to avail benefits of the NICSHARE portal. Because once the patients are registered in the NICSHARE portal, the patients get 500 rupees per month and the treating doctor gets 1,000 rupees for notification and reporting of the patient, okay? The apps are for the patient to get more information about TB. Thank you. I'll be glad to take questions. Yeah. Is it identifiable, compulsory to be uh, reported disease at present? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a punishable offense. Punishable offense. So you have to report. <laughs> So you have to go and report it on this portal, is it? Madam? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to. So most of your institutes, especially the ones that no, are... We are in private practice. Suppose we are in the institute, it's okay. But we are in private practice. So how do we go about no, it? That's very easy. You register on app and mobile. You are separately candidate. So it's compulsory, but... It's compulsory and it's punishable. Yeah, it's compulsory. Yeah. Most chemists don't keep the... Yeah. So now you have yeah. most of the anti-DB yeah. medicines. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so that is one thing. Uh, there are sites uh, where we may not like to do the biopsy because it's too much of trouble or too much invasive. So every time I will not get a yield or I will not send biopsy. City uh, uh, Spine is one thing. Uh, maybe brain. Ga gynecologists uh, often put them on uh, uh, empirical anti TB for infertility. Yeah. And they consume within six months. Uh, so when there, even your uh, table suggested that there is a column on the left yeah. top that empirical. Yeah. So we presume they are all sensitive. Yeah. So that depends upon the history. So yeah. most of our patients tend to have a history where you know the family members are either suffering from tuberculosis. So it's imp it's important that we you know we take the history, see what kind of TB they are suffering from. So if suppose if there's a family member who's suffering from drug resistant TB, it's more likely that this patient is also suffering from drug resistant TB. So it's important that we take the history and then decide about, you know, what kind of regimen, especially if we do not want to get a, give a microbiological confirmation. So I guess it's, but, but it's better. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned about weight gain. Yeah. Suppose even a 2 kg of weight gain can push a patient no, no, from no. one category to the other. No, no, no so no. it has to be a 5 kilogram weight gain, but which shift to the other category. By and large. 14 kg is, I understand, 14, for 14 kg weight, you get one tablet. One tablet, yeah. And roughly, that is the rule of thumb. Yeah. And if it's closer to 56, you give four. If it's closer to 42, you give three. If it is... Uh, 5 kg within the spelling is same category, still you have to... Uh, continue with the same. So it's 5 kg into the next weight band would be an addition of a tablet. With the maximum dose. Yeah. Dr. Preeti. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so in a city like Mumbai, it's easy. We have chest physicians like you, which we refer. You don't do the drug manual. Don't look into what medicines to give, what doses to give. What about rural India? What you would advise to the orthopods from all over the country 
in villages, okay. you know, where don't have access to chess physicians. Uh, no, so even if there's no access to chess physicians, there are district TB officers who are trained in managing TB. So we as chess physicians and people who deal with a lot of TB, we keep on taking, uh, you know, uh, uh, lectures or series for them to update their knowledge. So the, every district has a dis district TB officer to whom you can approach. Okay, so he is most of the time trained in managing these patients, especially relating to TB. So even if you do not have a chest physician, you can refer to a DTO. And even the most expensive drugs government is offering free, very expensive, yeah, very expensive. It is free only if it is positive, empirical, no, they are no, not no. giving it. <coughs> so empirical, there is a provision for 15% clinical, based, starting on the basis of clinical judgment. Okay, okay? so quite a lot of time, like especially spinal TB is a possibility state. So a lot of time you may not yeah, have not actually, getting. yeah. No, possibly you may not yield anything at all, but you may have a history of contact in the family which is saying, okay, the patient has a relative who has DRTB. So you want to start the patient on DRTB, you can say, okay, clinically and based on history, I want to start. So they, they would start. That's not an issue. 15% provision for starting empirical AKT for second line based on clinical, uh, that, you know, that, a clinical that is assessment. That's the biggest problem, possibly. Even if you send buckcut, tubercular, spine, or a saucer, says, will not come. Uh, and Plenty of soft tissue, sometimes there is no growth, even at six weeks. Yeah. In very uh, top end centers, which are uh, equipped to do uh, grow uh, um, mycobacteria. Yeah. Something like Choitram in Indore is a very old institute, very well equipped, but uh, it doesn't grow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so one la last question from me. So uh, in a patient who is uh, not responding uh, for a first line of AKT, so how you decide to change into second line? Is it the duration or the symptoms? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, that was one of the examples that I gave actually. Yeah. So we generally wait for the intensive phase to get over, okay? So a period of two months, see if the patient is clinically responding or no. See, you know, then you do a follow-up uh, radiological investigation and see how bad the lesions have become. If possible, it is better. It's always better to get a microbiological confirmation. Okay. Partly because bedoquilene does well if we have levofloxacin, that is sensitive, okay? So the, uh, uh, the, the outcome of betaquilin-based regimen depends upon the sensitivity to vinylones. So if we have a microbiological confirmation and subsequently, you know, we know what the pattern is for drug sensitivity or resistance, we'll tend to do better. But if at the end of two months, take a, take a cutoff of two months, the patient's not doing well, refer for evaluation of drug resistant TP. I would say that. Okay, so you, if it's a biopsy, yeah, so if it's a biopsy, simply send it in normal saline. And sim Okay, so it's a biopsy. No, 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 if, if, if the more the better, but you have to send it to a higher center. Uh, they would send, yeah, so they would centrifuge it. So our laboratory at JJ Hospital is a intermediate reference laboratory. They're happy with bigger samples because the yield is better. So I guess, yeah, so and take in saline. Messages. Don't prescribe, send to your chest physician. Okay, that's the shot. Or no ortho portion. Yeah, for drug resistant, <laughs> yeah. definitely. But for drug sensitive, I think it should be okay don't, for your. Don't yeah. use your brains. <laughs> Which is better sample, pus or bone for gene expert? Pus would be a better sample. I also a question. Uh, I'm also working in a rural setup since five years now. But uh, the problem we are facing, me and my HOD, is like, uh, many people don't afford the test uh, and by, by after referring to chest physician, government, government needs the positive results and no. we... No, 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 no. no. So that what is we, are, we, we are telling patient because it, it somewhat it is like ruling out everything, then it must be TB, then you start AKT. But for patient, people are not affording and we are, if you are prescribing uh, uh, AKT, they are not affording, government ka positive reports chahiye and uh, physicians are like, matlab, no, no, no. Is so like that, that is why I said this, the last slide that I gave you was about tbcindia.org and the Nikshare. On the web, on that portal, you simply register, tell your HOD, I mean, tell your institute to get registered on that. If once the patient is entered on the portal, all the investigations on all the AKT, all the follow-up investigations, plus 500 rupees per month in the patient's bank account free. is free. Okay? So just register on the portal, everything would be done free. Uh, no need of positive free. results. Yeah, CB NAT is free. Okay. As sir is saying, CB NAT is free. Yeah. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, madam. Please take your seat. Thank you so much. Thank you, madam, for the excellent talk.
Let me invite Dr. Abhijit Pawar how to do a good spinal biopsy so that it comes positive. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Team Vyrock. Um, first of all, I would like to acknowledge my two teachers in orthopedics. Dr. Lingayat, who was one of my first teachers when I started my orthopedic residency, and my last teacher, Dr. Mihir Bapad. So I'm really glad that they are the panelists here. Thank you, sir. So I'll start with the spinal biopsy error recommendations and from collection to inocula inoc inoculation. So don't miss or mess the principles, that's the take home message here. And we start with one case. This is a 46 year old male uh, patient, back pain, uh, three months since three months progressive, fever, loss of appetite, weight loss since last two months, night cries and raised DSR. These are his uh, MRI pictures here. He had constitutional symptoms, chronic clinical symptoms, radiological, radiologically uh, spondylar discitis. Uh, he was started on a uh, empirical uh, four drug EKT. Two months uh, on empirical EKT, three months and five months. He continued to progress uh, in despite um, the anticox treatment. So we know what went wrong. So why this happens is, can we rely only on the MRI for diagnosis? So no, the MRI has certain limitations, particularly in spinal tuberculosis. Or, so these are the few cases where you see the, these all these patients were on empirical AKT, they had spondylodiscitis, they had vertebral collapse, they had soft tissue involvement and on empirical AKT they continued to worsen. Uh, one, here the name is not clear, this is one of them is this is hydratated disease, this is myeloma, um, after bi this is after biopsy, uh, this is fungal spondylodiscitis, uh, the case here is uh, giant cell tumor, a plasma cytoma uh, and an insufficiency fracture. So diagnosis can vary. So you can't say that this is what I feel and this is the empirical equity I'm going to start. A biopsy is mandatory at least in spinal uh, lesion nowadays. Yes, there are some limitations of biopsy, we'll come to that, but biopsy is the first thing you go, uh, otherwise you are likely to go wrong. So have a high index of suspicion for TB spine, not all lesions looking like TB are tuberculosis. MRI is only suggestive and not diagnostic. MRI can mislead you all. Radiologically and clinically, all lesions look similar. Biopsy is the only way to differentiate. Culture sensitivity done before empirical AKT is mandatory. You can't get away with all, I think, these principles. So definite diagnosis, biopsy, either a CT guide biopsy, if the patient has neurological deficit and you need, he think needs a surgery, then open biopsy in these cases. But you need to have a tissue diagnosis, you need to have a culture sensitivity. The contraindications are there, so bleeding diastasis or suspected vascular lesion on inaccessible sites like odontoid and C1. So the technique, the radiologists do it uh, with a white bore, a jamshed needle or true cut needle. Uh, after you cross the pedicle, you remove the trocar and then push the cannula uh, into the appropriate site and try to get as much a sample as possible. Rotate the needle, use a suction with a syringe to get maximum sample. The length of the sample, the more the length of the sample, the accurate the diagnosis will be. Yes, the you might not get a diagnosis, there are certain limitations, but that doesn't mean you should not do it. It is mandatory. Most of the times you will get it. And the sample has to be sent for histopathological examination, it's, it's also mandatory. Because the, then also gene expert, the RIF ultra test, aerobic stain and culture, TB culture, the gold standard and the fungal stain and culture if you are suspicious. Now one of this is likely to come positive. If all this gene expert is negative, you might uh, have some KJ lesions on the histopathological examination and you can reach a diagnosis. So your infection disease specialist or even yourself can combine all this test and come to a diagnosis that is this a tuberculous spondylar discitis or it's a malignancy or it's a pathological fra or any other uh, pathological fracture. The diagnostic, now, but here comes the limitations. The diagnostic ac accuracy of CT guide biopsy is still from 71 to 97 percent. And the complication rates are like hematomas and transient paralysis. But the most important thing I see here is there can be patients who are false uh, negatives. And the, the gene expert test is mandatory. We should do it all the time. The, it is positive even if bacterial load is 16 per ml and also gives inf information on rifampicin resistance. So you can. To begin with, you have uh, one uh, drug resistance test already done. And TB culture, positive with bacteria is 10 bacteria per ml. 
So if patient is only thing is the, if the patient has already received AKT or drugs with anti tuberculous activity like linezolid, amikacin, quinolones, may be negative. And if positive, should be, we should do INH susceptibility. So I think this is a part of my practice. Whenever I do biopsy, the first thing I would do is histopathological and at least a gene expert um, to rule out tuberculosis. And other microbiologic methods, later on you can do spiro sequencing. Uh, eventually after three weeks, is, it tells about INH resistance and second line drug resistance. Uh, line probe assay 1 tells about HR resistance, INH and rifampicin resistance. Line probe assay 2 tells you about rifampicin resistance to quinolones and aminoglycosides. So, you should be in a setup where you have these facilities. Uh, and I think most of the centers do have these facilities nowadays. However, the limitations of ct biopsy are, and the, the ct biopsy and gene expert can still mislead the diagnosis in case of infected spinal discitis. And, and there are some exceptions to that, and we have seen that. As a, because it's, the accuracy is about 75 to 90 percent. There are some cases where it can be negative. Now this is one example, 15-year-old male child, D12 pathological fracture. Um, CT cat biopsy uh, showed pseudomonas, inflammation on the histopathological examination, uh, antibiotics started, transient improvement, followed by recurrence of fever and back pain. Um, two months into AKT, there was no clinical improvement, persistent severe back pain, fever, weight loss, underwent bronchoscopy because some lung lesions were there and biopsy from the subcarinal lymph nodes, uh, trace positive gene expert, lymph nodes, non-specific inflammation, first line drugs did not respond to first line drug because he was gene expert positive. Then second line treatment was started, Se two weeks into two, uh, second line regime, no improvement, worsening of back pain, uh, child became almost non-ambulatory. Then, then infection disease board uh, advised third biopsy after CT scan of the abdomen was done uh, from paraortic lesion which was suggestive of Hodgkin's lymphoma so, and which resolved by chemotherapy. So the take home message is here is always have a high index of suspicion for tuberculosis, not all spinal discarditis is tuberculosis in nature. Biopsy is mandatory in all lesions. Repetitive, repeat spine procedures invasive may be needed. You have to explain to the patient that CT guard biopsy might come negative and he might need one or two biopsies later on. And you have to explain this to, to the patient eventually. Otherwise, they become very upset. The previous patient was, the relatives were very upset when they had two negative uh, biopsies and he kept on worsening. But we had explained them that he might need another biopsy uh, and eventually we could uh, find the right lesion. Choose the site of biopsy appropriately and the interpret the results of investigations carefully. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, so I will ask uh, uh, Bhavuk, uh, so how you select uh, the target area for biopsy based upon on MRI or X-rays? So Basically, uh, as rightly said, I, I discussed with Mehra the, uh, the pus actually we target if there is a sauce abscess or this thing. So we first go for ultrasound guided drainage and we send okay. it for the sampling because gene expert in our series also gene expert has got the uh, very good uh, sensitivity uh, this thing towards okay. picking up tuberculosis. Okay. But if we have only bony involvement then we uh, you know we have a radiology conference every uh, week on Tuesday with our radiologist right. and we ask them the best site and they tell us the you know the, the best pedicle which one to choose and this thing. So because they can look at the, the best, you know, the, because for when you're taking the biopsy from the bone, you need a good bone tissue as well. Right. So you don't want to go into the liquefaction area. Right. So that you can choose from the base of imaging. Right. But it, it's our common belief that uh, the abscesses has necrotic bacilli as well as necrotic tissue. Yes. Okay. So gene expert might be detecting a, a dead bacilli. Yeah. But whatever yeah. it is, yeah. the disease there, but the dead bacilli, so what about the is, culture? We are looking for no, culture also. Yeah, if you are looking for culture, see the the yield of culture is very low as compared to gene expert histopathology. Right. So right. we have done. A, I will show in our prospective study as well. We have pr we have shown that the best results, you know, we get by histopathology and gene expert. Okay. So you are always targeting the abscesses rather than the abscesses as well as the bone tissue. If you are bone, bone tissue yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. Okay. So you go two times. If so possible? see if there is yeah. a source abscess, then we send it for ultrasound guided drainage, right. and then we send the sample. Right. But if you are taking the, the the patient, you know, uh, this thing this thing for this thing uh, biopsy, yeah. then we uh, send the bone tissue. And Deeraj, uh, so tra uh, you know, trace a positive gene expert in a bone lesion is significant, whereas a trace positive gene expert from a lung or sputum biopsy is can be insignificant. Right. Now that is one which we found in this study is that 
um, a trace po a sputum can always have a trace positive gene expert uh, and that can be uh, you know deceptive sometimes so but whereas if you have a lesion like a pus or a bone biopsy which is showing trace positive gene expert then you should uh, treat that as tuberculosis but also there is uh, so literature also supports that granulation tissue the infected granulation tissue should, should be always targeted and it, when it is specially hyper intense on uh, t2 so these areas are the best uh, no of course see yeah. we target the maximum area involved i mean as bahuk said bone area is better but the maximum where pus inoculum is even better but any of those lesions if it shows trace positive expert whether it's dead bacteria or as well i mean it is significant and it has to be regarded as tuberculosis abhijit the biopsy is done when patient has already received 2 3 weeks 4 weeks anti tb Yes, uh, so you have to stop uh, anti-tuberculosis drug for a couple of weeks. That will require really guts to stop it if you are suspecting yeah, because otherwise it. You are, so in the clinical setting. You need the more guts to treat them chronic, eventually. <laughs> granulomatous, uh, not even granulomatous, chronic is, uh, inflammation. inflammation. No evidence of TB or malignancy because unless True, he sees uh, caseating granuloma, he won't report. Uh, so what should be done? So the so recommendation is stop the AKT for two weeks. Uh, and then take a biopsy. If still you get a negative biopsy, counsel the patient, he might need another biopsy in future. So who does the biopsy? Either is the orthopedic with the CM or it's a radiology no, with the CT guide biopsy scan. is much better because the accuracy and target, it's a targeted uh, biopsy. So yeah. ideally a good radiology. Under a CM you might not reach the appropriate site, you know, because the thoracic lesions, high thoracic lesions, the obese patients, you might not see it clearly and you might end up getting a suboptimal tissue. Right. Actually you should consult with the CT scan that way. CT. Yeah. Although you yeah, can do it in the CT scan and do it by yourself, yeah, it's not a big deal. Not no big. Of them. Some they are they are the show of hands, how many do it themselves and how many refer to the radiologist for the biopsy? You do it yourself. So and how? Not all of them. See, if the first sample has failed, so if the CT guided biopsy has failed and you see an obvious bony lesion there where you can pick up a good sliver of bone, then you Try to do it ourselves in an accessible area. So that's that's how it is because a fine needle versus a true cut needle. That's that's. No, I think I'm out of. So uh, a fine needle versus a true true cut needle. Now, it's a CT guided biopsy is a true cut biopsy. You get a better yield. They don't do it. That's the whole issue. And the next point is. That's why we prefer the CM guided biopsy. But there is also a matter of convenience. Also, like if there are children, you know, I have to take. See, then I send it to the radiologist. The reason being because you know they have a separate slot for the GA. They will eat my my GA time in my theater. So you know these sort of things they have to, you have to also. May not be yeah. Well visible. Yeah, well visible. So the children, you know, this the GA time and all those things, they have a separate slots for GA biopsy and all those cases. So that thing is also matters. Yeah. So and once we have sent it to the radiologist, yeah. so how many of us discuss with the radiologist what we are doing and how to go about the dive? Because in a busy practice. We meet every every Tuesday, we meet and we discuss. Not everything. you, Bauk, but what about the rest no, of us? <laughs> in our hospital, the problem with the, the department is not interested in taking biopsy. Yeah, the most problem yeah, is so, so, so they are only interested in intervention and other stuff. So the biopsy is the most neglected one. They take, they give longer. Dheeraj, I disagree with you. <coughs> Me in my center, Medical College, Aurangabad, most of the radiologists, they are interested in doing the CT guided biopsy. So, they. They suggest that, faster that they, they suggest that they, you take the biopsy from this area, it will become positive. Uh, one uh, addition to the Abhijit that he said that biopsy is must in every cases. Mm -hmm. I agree with, 100% mm -hmm. I agree with. Mm -hmm. But as sir says that uh, some accessible areas, are unaccessible areas are there. And even though you take the biopsy, in that case it comes out to be negative. The RNTCP guidelines are there that if mm -hmm. you get a radiological evidence of pot spine, mm -hmm. if you have clinical evidence of pot spine and chronicity of the disease, Right. Radiological evidence means there should be abscess and right. a good radiologist can diagnose the abscess very well. Right. And you can continue empirical AKT for 6 to uh, 8 weeks huh. and if that, after that if you are not getting any results, if you are not getting a weight gainer like that, right. huh, then you revise your diagnosis. As you say that it may be a different things or it may be a MDR tuberculosis. So these are the standard protocols which are given by RNTCP. So right. RNTCP has changed now. Now the WHO index no, no. guidelines these are, are followed. These are the recent guidelines. No, no, sir. I'm part of that group. I'm part of that group. We are in the... the so because the, uh, the I work with my professor, that is Avinash Lambi is there in the Aurangabad. He has said that these are the recent guidelines which has suggested. Because sir, initially, I'm initially they used to give for six months of AKT. 
now they are extended to 18 month of akt for sir the standard work. guidelines is, is if the if your area is endemic for mdr yeah. that means if this is more than 5% you have to take the biopsy yeah. you have to take the biopsy okay. but if you contradict to that if the area is endemic it is chance to you have a chance to start the empir empirical akt also it is given in our ntcp endemic area endemic area See, I think, I think. Yeah, so uh, the NTEP or the National Tuberculosis Elimination Program guidelines have a provision for starting AKT in 15% of the patients on clinical basis, okay? So for some reason, if you're not able to get any microbiological confirmation at all, but you have a history which is suggestive of TB or radiological uh, if evidence of TB, and if you have a family history or you have history of contact, you can start the patient on empirical AKT. That is in 15% of the patients, okay? So there is a provision. It's not that, you know, if you do not have a microbiological confirmation, AKT cannot be started on. So there is a provision, so you can start. Most of the times, um, I think there's a huge discussion about inaccessible areas of not being able to get a good specimen enough to give a microbiological confirmation. So I guess if you think as a, as a surgeon or as a treating doctor that it is TB, go ahead and start it. So the protocol which we follow at AIMS is the, if the patient comes to us and he has a history of ATT intake less than two weeks, then we go for biopsy. If the patient has history of ATT intake two weeks or more, then we again wait for two weeks more. We, we let him continue, <coughs> then we monitor his clinical and the CRP, then we, if he improves, then we continue with that empirical. Only. <coughs> yes, the two weeks is the, is the standard, this thing they say it takes its effect. And then, and then, you know, and if the patient doesn't improve after f f f this thing two weeks, then we go for uh, again biopsy. Right, right. No, 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 sir. No, 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 sir. We, uh, we give them appointment. There's no, no problem. Yeah, so it's ideally two months. Two months. Two, months. Two, months. Two, months. two weeks we follow. Six weeks to eight weeks, sir. It is ideal time. Six weeks to eight weeks. Appointment this is not like that, sir. Once the patient has come into our system, then we follow them. Then we follow them. I think, I think uh, somewhere down the line, uh, we are missing the whole point here amongst all these guidelines and all. The question is, if, if a patient comes to me and I know that I cannot do a good biopsy, is it not my responsibility as a treating physician to refer that patient to some place <laughs> where a good biopsy will be done? Now, whether that is a city or a rural place, are we committed to diagnosing? That's the whole issue there. country of 1 billion with so much of disparity there and uh, uh, sup suppo suppose in principle we agree that every patient will be referred to bhav uh, it is impossible for to, for them to handle that workload so there will be therapeutic trials and a middle and, and, and a mid middle path is still will be 6 weeks and if he is not responding then refer those patients. lots of them will respond so i think this whole it's menace to say that no 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 i think uh, let madam answer that for us isn't the whole concept of an empirical AKT the reason for the multi-drug resistant tuberculosis to increase in this country? Yeah, so that is why the insistence, like my talk, gen, my talk was wholly around the whole concept of having a microbiological diagnosis before starting AKT. That is the whole concept. I mean, if we start empirical AKT, and especially with so much, we are contributing to more than 30% of world's MDR TB burden. Maharashtra per se is contributing to 40% of India's MDRTB burden. So, so Mumbai, in your opinion, yeah. in what period of time would MDRTB overtake sensitive TB in our country? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that would be a. So wild then, are we not account. are we not committed to biopsying every patient? So that was what the gist of my talk was. Sir, I add to this, sir. I add to this. It is not a biopsy confirmation. It is the underdose of the drug, yeah. which is more responsible yeah. for uh, and and irregular treatment. Irregular treatment. Which they are trying so to rectify. Another, another question are. to whoever has asked. In rural areas, also there are physicians. Orthopedic surgeons don't have to treat the medical exactly. part of this disease. So somebody just said that we refer to our city. No, as an orthopedic surgeon, it is your responsibility to refer the patient to a physician to get a good concept of a medical treatment going because every side effect, the physician knows better than you. Yeah. 
So that's that's the under point. Whether it is uric acid, whether it is itching, whether it is hepatitis, whether whatever it is, you are you have to refer it to a physician to start the EKT. So I don't think it is. We can just say that you know it's not possible. Everything is possible. It's the system exactly. that you evolve. Sir. So we'll move on to, uh, to our next session. So we'll call on uh, Dr. Bhavok Garg. Dr. Bhavok doesn't need any introduction. He's an additional professor in uh, Ames, Delhi. So he'll be speaking on surgical errors, selection to execution, and what's the bailout. So uh, thank you, uh, Dheeraj and the team Vairok. So I will be covering this uh, topic. Can I have my slides, please? Yeah. So uh, I'm not going to give you any knowledge. You all are knowledgeable. So I'm just going to share my experience of treating this disease. Uh, so we have the, I have the experience of treating more than 3,000 cases now, which we have the everything in, in, in record. So this is the, the paper which we published, the Diagnostic Yield of Image Guided Biopsy in Suspected This thing. It was a prospective study. And this is the, uh, the outcome. And we could diagnose only in, uh, you know, the overall sensitivity was 52% of cases, just. We have, could get the diagnosis. And the most common the, the thing which we get was from the gene expert and the histopathology. So, you know, various infections, you know, in the various tumors, and so also they can also mimic the, even in the sacroiliac joints also, the salmonella type So everything can be possible, even hydrated cysts. My previous speaker has also shown you this, this thing, different cases. This was an interesting case. We operated just, uh, you know, the four months back, TB case. We did the biopsy. Nothing came, so we it just showed some, you know, the uh, the hypervascular plasma cells or so, sort of things, and then we did the, uh, the he developed paraplegia. We operated him, and then the patient was following up. I was on vacation, so my senior resident was following up. After one month, when I saw him, he was not improving. He was still in the pain. So then I just looked at the histopathology and all the records, and the histopathology report said fungal profiles. So this is very common thing yeah, that we don't look at the histopathology reports once we have operated the patient. You know, the patient has improved, paraplegia has improved because you decompressed it but you haven't looked at the, 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 the diagnosis so you have to keep on looking at the the, the reports even after the the, the US done the surgery uh, not all infectious uh, discitis is tubercular this is our uh, series in which we get many tuberculosis mimickers also so always check the post-operative reports uh, the TB is a possibility disease the negative biopsy we got in 45 percent in our patients empirical therapy doesn't mean blind therapy you have to assess like you know we just discussed the clinical assessment logical findings laboratory tests and close follow-up also to see the response to treatment and may consider getting an MRI repeat in at four months which are not biopsy proven and these are the non-infectious condition which we could get in our series I'm just going to show you some example this was a case which will, you know, they, most of the patients they also have a history of it, tuberculosis in the past also. So that also deceives us. Uh, like this case uh, with the history of past this thing, uh, the only thing was that the there was a uh, the the two uh, vertebra having the the uh, the uh, the signal changes, but the end plates they were okay. So we were just, uh, this thing, the x-rays, they were not showing an analytic lesion. So we got the PET scan done, and it showed us the multiple myeloma, and we also get the uh, a site for, to get biopsy from the ileum, and we could get uh, multiple, this light chain kappa something, uh, this thing. This was another case uh, with history of pleural effusion. Uh, he was diagnosed as the, the psoas abscess, and, but uh, you know, this is the, the diagnosis written uh, by the radiologist there. And we, we discussed with our radiologist, and he could show us that the tail was tracking up to the tail of the pancreas. So it was a case of pancreatic pseudocyst. Another case of sauce hematoma, you know, history of trauma, and they can also present like the, the tuberculosis uh, people can diagnose. The, the hemangiomas, they are very frequently referred to us as the, as the, the tuberculosis, so one has to be very careful of diagnosing these hemangiomas as this thing. And CT is actually very, very useful where you can get the, the diagnosis very clearly. Uh, aggressive hemangiomas, they're also, you know, because they present with paraplegia, these sort of pictures, they, they look like this thing, and then they require, you know, some sort of uh, different treatment, and what we do, there is a very uh, path-breaking uh, treatment which is, uh, which has been done, uh, proved by Dr. Sharad Chandra, we inject alcohol, less than 100 ml, and you can get excellent results uh, in, in these cases. This was an interesting case, 28-year-old female, she presented to us with pain and this thing, this, this, all the classical features of tuberculosis, and we got the MRI done, and you can see that, you know, this was, uh, seen by at least eight uh, surgeons before and he was kept she was kept on the ATT but when we had discussed with the radiologist she, he said there is something unusual that the whole of the abscess is just on the one side there's nothing on the other side and then we looked at this thing and you see the the end plates there is there are no signs of any erosions on this thing with such a big abscess and then we got the CT scan done and the CT scan showed us a 
good, you know, the osteo, uh, osteoid osteoma. So these osteoid osteomas, they can produce so much inflammation that, you know, you can, and it is a very frequent, you know, it is very near to the vertebral body, it's very safe to get the RFA done, and it just got simply RFA done, and the patient was, uh, you know, the complete relief was there. Uh, another case, uh, you know, uh, this was again diagnosed as the, the uh, he was, uh, she was being treated as the, as the, um, uh, as the tuberculosis. But when we looked at the x-rays, the simple x-rays also provide that the tuberculosis cannot provide such sort of, you know, the, uh, the, the sclerosis. And then it came out to be a CA breast case. Another case, there was just one day history of analgesic back pain. He presented to us and then he was, you know, diagnosed on uh, ATT. But actually our radiologist then diagnosed as the uh, esophageal duplication cyst. Uh, this was diagnosed as. Uh, the end plate changes, you know, the modic changes, they also being, uh, the, especially the type 2 modic changes, small snorts, small snorts, they produce extensive inflammation sometimes, and they can also present as, uh, another is the rheumatoid panus, they also labeled as the atlanto tuberculosis, so one has to be very careful. This was one case where if the, if the edema is extending into the pedicle, you know, you have to think they're labeling it as tuberculosis before, and this was, you know, this can be a tuberculosis uh, tumor also. This was another case, he was started on this thing. Angspond is another differential diagnosis where these patients, they are uh, very commonly labeled as the, the tuberculosis. These sort of, you know, the, uh, the changes, again, you have to look at the x-rays. X-rays, if they don't show lysis, lysis, just think of something else, and this came out to be a metastasis from the colorectal carcinoma. This was the case of scoliosis because the, uh, the, 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 the anatomy is distorted, so people can diagnose different, different things. They, they, they just looked at this bright shadow and they labeled this tuberculosis. This was actually a lymphangioma and then, you know, it just didn't require any treatment. Another interesting case of Pidgeot's disease. So this was, you know, we looked at the blood reports. The alkaline phosphatase levels were very high and this was diagnosed as a, a case of Pidgeot's disease. So high index of suspicion, especially in the central lesions and multidisciplinary evaluation, which should consist of a spine surgeons, a chest physician or an infectious disease specialist, pathologist, microbiologist and a radiologist, they are necessary when you're dealing with this thing. So this is the largest study which we published of 1,652 patients, uh, which has doubled now uh, in, in last three, uh, two and a half years. And, you know, we, we could get the good results in with following the middle path regime only 10.5 percent of the patients they require the operative interventions symptomatic abscesses even if they present with the respiratory distress you can just go for ultrasound guided drainage and they do all well and then you can treat them conservatively uh, we our preference is to put them on 12 months of HRJD uh, this thing the the uh, ATT uh, latest evidence is that six months could be enough in some of the cases but again you have to go for all clinical laboratory and radiological things and this is a meta analysis we published that you know the six months can be enough also whole spine MRI should be done in all cases and even the cases which are drug sensitive at present they can become drug resistant over the course of the treatment so you have to ensure compliance correct doses in this thing so this was a case uh, this child presented to uh, some this thing usually they present with low back pain and then they get the MRI LS spine and this was the MRI but when the, we looked at the patient he was having upper motor neuron signs so we got the whole spine MRI done and you can see that there's an extensive abscess going up to the uh, you know the uh, the epidural abscess extending over the top to the CV junction this was another case he was operated outside uh, by someone who was having uh, constant pain but we again when we examined the, there was upper motor neuron signs so we got the whole spine MRI done and we could see that you know there was a lesion at the top as well and then it, that has to be decompressed. This was another case uh, there was no pain this patient went to some surgeon and he advised just the MRI and then he said that this is there is some severe deformity and the uh, we should be operating this patient uh, but when I asked the patient you know what are your complaints he, just a one day history of pain and I'm having this deformity since long and when we uh, got the uh, the x-ray done there was a whole calcified swass abscess you know so everything was already stabilized and you may need not to operate these patients because they were already living that no complaints so I'm not going to offer any surgery especially operating these calcified abscesses Again, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge. All blood vessels and everything, they are stuck there. Then there are traitors, you know, these sort of cases. We operated this patient for, uh, for uh, tuberculosis, and then he presented to us six months later. You can see that this, the whole destruction has advanced up to the top. The whole vertebral bodies have been eaten up. And then uh, this case was sensitive uh, tuberculosis. He converted to MDR. Uh, over a course of, you know, the six months, and then we have to extend top, and then we have to use the sublaminar wires, and the whatever the, the fixation points we could get in between the areas. I used the rib because that was fused in that area, so I just passed the laminar wire, and I just connected to the with, the, with the rod. Indication of surgery, we all know, neurological, non-neurological, 
uh, the, this was the, the indication of surgery in our series, which we, we published. And also, the, even in delayed cases, you can operate uh, this thing with good outcome. This is the, 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 the study which has been published by the, by the Ames Rishikesh people. They have, you know, uh, given these guidelines, spine at risk, we all know. And this should be, they are very useful in our clinical practice. Still, we, we use them. And especially in children, if there are more than two vertebras involved and there is kyphosis, I prefer to operate them because they unvariably, you know, they, they progress. So it is better to operate them. Principles of surgery, we all know. I'm not going to detail. The points remains, which approach should I use? How do I achieve thorough decompression? What should be the type and the length of my construct? How do I achieve an appropriate reconstruction? So this is our paper in which we have compared the anterior versus posterior approaches. The posterior approaches correct kyphosis better, and the posterior approaches were also associated with less morbidity and complications. So multiple ways to access the anterior column. Anterior de uh, decompression is necessary. You can go by transpedicular decompression, transversal decompression, postrolateral, uh, LECA approach, anything. And the minimally invasive treatment is also very effective. There is no need of radical debridement now. Enough studies are there. Ventral decompression is the key. Only lamectomy is not useful. You have to differentiate between soft TB and the hard TB. You know, all those components should be removed. This is an interesting case. There was a lot of granulation tissue we could make out in the MRI, and there was paraplegia. So this is a practical tip, you know, which I follow is that if there is a granulation tissue around the cord, then I prefer to do the finger dissection. So I just put my finger in that muck. I make a space up to the, this thing. And then once you break everything, and then you can use the, the nibblers or whatever thing to clear this thing. And once the, the cord is visible, then you can use your upcutter. Don't put your upcutter without, uh, you know, feeling that where is the, is the cord. This was another this is sort of epidural tuberculosis. They, they present very extensively. And in these cases, if there is a soft tissue, ab soft abscess, then you can use this red rubber or the catheter technique that you can do the laminectomy to one area. You can pass this thing, and the, you can decompress the whole of the, the spine. Uh, we have moved, you know, initially we used to use this titanium mesh cages, but now we have moved to these T-lift cages. We just need a TB heels. We just do the minimal ventral decompression, decompress your cord, and then you can put just your cages there. Uh, you know, just to just to give it a little bit support, and that is usually suffice. Uh, I have done many cases now. I think maybe more than 200 cases, and none of them has failed. Everything has united with these, uh, you know, the T lift cages. Construct. You can use the hard shield fixation, sublaminar wires, pedicular screws, pedicular screws, laminar screws, index screws, cross link connectors. I usually prefer minimum five anchors in the proximally in the good bone, and the minimum four uh, anchors distal in the good bone. Like this is the especially in the cervical thoracic junction. I use these laminar screws also in the thoracic spine. You know, these are very good, this thing, and we can save the motion segments in the, in the cervical spine. Especially in the, in the, in the lumbosacral junction, you should be well-versed with the placement of the sacroiliac screws as well. These sort of long fixations, you should not be leaving the too many segments uninstrumented in between. They are bound to fail, and these sort of complications happen. So the alternate screws, they are very useful, uh, you know, when you are putting, uh, operating these sort of cases. Index screws in lumbar spine, you need not to follow these extensive instrumentations. Again, you can use the shorter screws and you can get the, uh, the uh, good outcome. Beware that the aortas and the great vessel encasement, these are the cases in which you can see that there is a pseudo aneurysms around the aortas, and one has to be very careful, CTS assessment has to be this thing. I have three such cases, uh, you know, which I have in, in my, my series. Pay attention to the heel sinuses. Uh, this was a case of heel tuberculosis. We went for the deformity, there was a big sinus here. So if there's a big sinus here, always this thing that the anatomical landmarks, they're not going to be present there. So, uh, especially when we are putting the cervical particular screws freehand, you need the anatomic landmarks, so they are not going to be there. So, you know, this case we operated, we did the front and back VCR, and you know, the, the, you can see that I have put the, the, uh, the particular screw on the one side, where the sinus was not there, the landmarks were still intact, but the other side I had to resort to the, uh, the, the, uh, the lateral mass screws. These are some of the, uh, the cases. This is our follow-up with the, you know, the, the paper with the, which we have published for the post-tubercular deformity patients. We have done, uh, the, you know, the 47 uh, three-column osteotomies. There is no role of PSO or SPOs in isolation in spinal deformity correction. You have to go for three-column osteotomies. PSO, thoracic PSOs, there are very technical points I'm not going to detail. We can always discuss, but the thoracic PSO, especially in the proximal thoracic, you have to be aware of the, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, when the vasovagal syncope because the, when you're dissecting around the, especially in the T4 to T6 area, when you're dissecting going around the vertebral body, uh, there are some fibers which supply the heart. So there could be a uh, bradycardia and this thing, heart uh, is stored. So you have to be very careful when you're doing the dissection. Tell your anesthetist that I'm dissecting in that area. Keep the atropine ready uh, for these sort of cases.
these are some of the, the proximal thoracic cases which we done. Extended PSO we have, we, we have used, we using, so after doing the PSO, we take a burr and we take a bigger wedge. Because we have neuromonitoring, we do the control closer and we can see, uh, you know, uh, if, if there are any signal changes or not. We can use table to, uh, to break uh, and the, the, uh, closing the osteotomies. This is sort of extended PSOs you can close with the, uh, safely with the help of the neuromonitoring. These are you know, some of the cases. This was 115 degree cases. So again, you know, D7 to L4 was fused in a single mass. So again, with the help of these extended PSOs, you can treat these, these patients. Vertebral column resection, again, you require for severe uh, deformities. I am not going to detail, but you have to be, beware when you're dealing with children. There are specific tips which you have to follow because in children, the whole blood volume is less than two liters and the average blood loss in uh, VCR is two liters. Uh, minimum. These sort of extensive uh, deformities when you are doing them, we have a special technique for these cases for which we have published the modified VCR. What we do, we keep the midline intact till the end. Once you have done your vertebral column resection, then you take out the posterior column. What happens, the cord is hanging from the posterior column with the help of the bridging epidural veins. And then it is draped over the, the anterior, uh, the, the posterior wall. So if you take out the posterior wall, uh, if you take out the, the posterior bridge, First, then the whole cord falls on the, on, the, on, the, on the posterior wall. And then you insert something between the cord and this thing, and that is going to damage the, this, the blood supply. And you see here, this case, we have done the completed the VCR, and you can still see that how healthy is the cord. You can still see the pulsations even after doing the, uh, the VCR complete. These sort of cases, you do, this sort of pulsation you don't see when you, are, you have first taken out the, uh, the, this thing. And this is the, the outcome. The clinical outcome you can see here. So specific tips when you're doing deformity corrections, use proximal screw as hooks because there is an extensive lordosis, extensive kyphosis there. So you can use the, the, the first screw which you have put there. You can, you can uh, let your, uh, the handle, the screw handle into that screw. You can pull it up and then you're the entry point of the other screw, it will come up. So you can ask your assistant to hold the, 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 the screw with that with, in your hand and then you can make the entry point for the screw. Titanium rods, never go for cobalt chrome rods when you're going to correct these deformities. Reduction screws, so if, you're, if, there is a, if there is a positive sagittal balance, then I prefer to put the reduction screws in the distal area. If there's a negative sagittal balance, I put it in the proximal area. Neuromonitoring, D-waves, most of them, they are having this spastic paraparesis, so neuromonitoring may not pick up the motor one, so we use D-wave. Ketamine is again a very useful adjunct. If you see that the signals, they have dropped, then give ketamine. Ketamine they enhances the whatever neuromonitoring signals are there, so ketamine again is very, very good. Look at the lordosis of the proximal segment. Long-standing uh, uh, deformities, they, they have the lordosis in the proximal segment, so screw pullouts, they are very useful. In such cases, the in-situ benders, you know, the whatever the, the vertical in-situ benders, they are very useful. Always, always give kyphosis as the proximal part of the rod if it is going to the thoracic regions. Dedicated osteotomy sets, spoon retractors, horseshoe breakers, they are must if you are doing these deformities. This is the another technique which you have published. If there is a kyphosis, you have done the, the osteotomy and the, 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 uh, the spinal cord is exposed. So once the patient lies down, then the soft tissue, it goes into the defect and it can impinge on the cord. So what we do, we just open up the titanium mesh cage and then we fix it with the help of the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the tension bend wires and we screw, we hold it with the, with the head of the screws. So this is again useful, and this is my, uh, we have filed the patent for this thing. This is the rip screw which we have designed. This is called the rip pedicle screw. So this is to reduce the proximal junctional kyphosis at the top, and we make it a falcon construct where the, the hooks, they goes into the rib also. So it gives a very good support in the, in the proximal area. Plastic surgery involvement is very, very essential. This is our paper in, 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 the, in the national. So these sort of plastic tissue spacers and all this thing very important. This child was very severe. This thing we did a VCR in this uh, in this child, and but there was you know the this the this was problem with the with the uh, the screw heads and this thing. So we had to go for the plastic surgery cases. So TB presents many challenges in day-to-day -day practice. Uh, one has to be very careful. They are going to be there if you are going to treat these patients. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Bhavuk. Uh, that was a lot and lot of uh, learning. Sorry, and, uh, I was not aware what to cover and what to not. <laughs> no, no, but uh, uh, it was uh, uh, fantastic. Uh, so, any questions from our delegates uh, to Dr. Bhavuk? Yeah, yeah Tosh. Uh, so, uh, this is a question for all panelists, basically. So, with the emergence of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, the uh, chances of mono drug resistant tuberculosis is also increasing. So how many of you uh, 
uh, especially if the uh, gene expert shows the rifampicin sensitive pattern, uh, advise 14 drug uh, DST uh, as opposed to 14.